there tonight with two of the most powerful people in the world coming face to face for the first time in a year. That meeting wrapping up in just the last few minutes. President Biden and the Chinese leader trying to talk things out at a time when tensions, you know, are high between these countries. We'll tell you what happened in their meeting behind closed doors as we take you live from San Francisco right near where it all went down. Plus, some intense rain happening in Florida tonight. Millions of people now under a flood watch. We'll tell you just how bad it could get. And an early sign that the economy may be starting to slow down right in time for the holiday season. Why Americans seem to be cutting back on shopping recently. Then F1's most important race of the year coming up, Las Vegas this weekend. A new documentary is taking a look at what's at stake for a sport trying to win over Americans. We've got the reporter who helped bring this all together going behind the scenes with us in tonight's backstory. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and in just a couple of hours, President Biden is going to talk to the country. He's going to hold this news conference after a huge high-stakes meeting with China's Xi Jinping. Here you have two of the most powerful people in the world meeting for their first face-to-face -face conversation in a year. That meeting behind closed doors wrapping up in just the last few minutes before we came on the air. Here's the deal, right? We weren't expecting any breakthroughs by any means. The White House has been careful to keep expectations on the low side. But what they really wanted to come out of this is essentially getting the U.S. and China back on friendly terms, back on at least talking terms, and getting past some tense moments between these two countries. Listen. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. For two large countries like China and the United States, turning their back on each other is not an option. It is unrealistic for one side to remodel the other, and conflict and confrontation has unbearable consequences for both sides. I want to bring in Janice Mackey-Frayer, who is joining us now live here from the United States. Janice, as you cover this beat Beijing every single day, we know that the U.S. wanted to get China back on talking terms here. We know that the president in just a couple of hours is going to be holding that news conference. Talk me through what you see as the most significant pieces to come out of this critical summit today. Walk us through it. Well, it, all of the messaging in advance of the meeting was to lower expectations, certainly among U.S. officials, saying, look, there are not going to be any huge deals announced out of this. But the main takeaway of it, Hallie, is that these two powerful leaders are at least again talking. And that was the whole objective of this meeting, was to try to stabilize U.S.-China relations to bring them off that historic low. Uh, they have not spoken in a year, and it has been a year. If you consider all of the issues um, feeding U.S.-China tensions, there are tariffs, there are the tech export controls, there's the South China Sea, there is tension over Taiwan and uh, what uh, China considers a red line in terms of its sovereignty of Taiwan. Uh, we also had the spy balloon crisis uh, several months ago, and to a point where uh, the two sides were at real risk of not being able to get things back on track. There were several secretaries who were able to visit Beijing over the course of the summer, including Secretary Blinken, and they believed that because there was that footing, it got things to the point where they get President Xi Jinping and President Biden sitting at the same table again. Let me ask you about two specific sets of issues, Janice. First, when we talk about goals domestically here in the United States, there's this deal now about an issue that a lot of people care a lot about, and that's the fentanyl crisis here. These two leaders are set to announce some, some terms on that, essentially, but we've seen some similar commitments from China on this front before. What's your sense of whether this deal could really change things? Well, I think what might be different this time is that a fentanyl cooperation is nothing new. Uh, this was something that had existed between the two sides until China broke off all of the talking terms uh, after Nancy Pelosi's controversial visit to Taiwan. That's when they broke off the military to military contacts, the climate talks and the fentanyl cooperation. What is going to likely come out of this is effectively a joint working group where both the U.S. and the Chinese side have people who are working together to try to stem the flow of fentanyl precursors from China into the U.S. via Mexico. What's 
important to understand is where the Chinese are coming from on this side. They look at fentanyl not as a, a Chinese supply issue, but a U.S. demand issue. Um, but they had been told in meetings over the course of the summer that if they were able to do this, to, to have this sign of cooperation on an issue that's so seriously affecting the United States, it could do a lot in terms of shifting U.S. public opinion towards China. Janice, we also know internationally here that, it, you know, this isn't just about the stuff happening in the United States. She and Biden are also talking, President Biden are also talking about some other issues going on overseas as part of this closed door meeting. Obviously, the war in Ukraine, obviously the war between Israel and Hamas, as you're seeing on screen here. I wonder, Janice, with your many years of experience covering China, covering specifically Xi Jinping, covering the intersection here, the relationship between the U.S. and China, um, where this goes next, right? In other words, with the bar set fairly low as it relates to deliverables, what comes out of this conversation, let's say a month from now, six months from now, a year from now? Well, it's no secret that China's economy uh, is needing some help. And that's the other part of Xi Jinping's reason to be here is to try to shore up economic ties with China's number one trading partner. What the U.S. can get in return is China's leverage, China's leverage with Russia uh, in effect to the war, uh, with effect to the, with the war in Ukraine, uh, China's influence with Arab countries, uh, with the Israel Hamas war, and also leverage with North Korea uh, to get Pyongyang to stop sending weapons and ammunition to Russia to send into the war in Ukraine. So the U.S. is also looking to leverage uh, China's influence in this respect. What we're also seeing, Hallie, which is really interesting, is that we're, we're coming off of years of what is effectively anti-U.S. propaganda in China and in Chinese state media, where the U.S. is framed as like this global bully that's trying to contain China. There has been such a shift over the last few weeks where there's now almost a pro-U.S propaganda campaign. And that is the big, biggest signal that the Chinese leadership is wanting to shift public opinion as proof that they're willing to re-engage with the U.S. again. Hallie? Jan Janice, um, we're so glad to see you there in San Francisco. We'll be checking back in with you throughout the evening. As we know, there's a lot still to develop on the story with that news conference now just a couple hours away. Appreciate it, Janice. Let's take you overseas now for another huge international story, and that is this war between Israel and Hamas with the Israeli military today inside Gaza's main hospital in what it's calling a targeted operation against Hamas, a major escalation in this ground attack in the Gaza Strip. As Israel, now defiant, is reiterating it is not going to give up on its ground campaign in the Gaza Strip in retaliation for that horrific Hamas terror attack last month. The Israeli prime minister is saying there is no place inside Gaza the IDF will not reach. This new raid inside Al-Shifa Hospital that's becoming a centerpiece of this war is intensifying fears and uncertainty over what could happen to the thousands of civilians, including dozens of premature babies who are trapped inside with water running out, fuel running out, food running out. We've got to be clear here. We still don't know a lot about what's happening inside this hospital right now. There is just not a lot of visibility into the reality on the ground. It's possible that a full comms blackout could happen. The biggest telecom company inside Gaza says that's coming soon. That could make it even harder to get a sense of the reality there, make it harder for people to even talk to each other in Gaza. Israel says this raid is an operational necessity because the IDF has intel that Hamas is working inside the hospital, storing weapons there, maybe even holding hostages there. That's a claim that Hamas denies, as do Palestinian doctors and health officials. All of it, as Israel now says it's letting some fuel into Gaza for the first time since this war started, with growing pressure now from aid groups and some international leaders to do more to protect the innocent people caught in the middle. Our Raf Sanchez getting rare access today, embedding with the Israeli military into Gaza City. Look at this. He's seeing Palestinians, civilians trying to escape to southern Gaza. He's seeing that with his own eyes for the first time. Watch. For Israel, this is proof of their commitment to get civilians out of harm's way, get them to the relative safety of the South. But for Palestinians, this opens up a lot of their own national trauma of people displaced by war, unsure when, if, they'll ever be able to go home. The Israeli military did put conditions on this embed. NBC News agreed to show Israel's military the raw footage collected. 
I want to bring in Kier Simmons now, who is also in the region. He is live for us on the ground in Tel Aviv now. Kier, let's start with this hospital, because the international spotlight is on Al-Shifa Hospital right now. What do we know? And, and I know it's not clear to the level of specific detail that I think we'd want to see. What's happening inside? What is next for these very critical hours for the people trapped there as the military operation expands? Well, that's right, Hallie. There are many patients and medical staff inside the hospital. The operation seems to have wound down a, a little bit tonight. A doctor we spoke to from the hospital, we managed to get through after many hours of trying, uh, telling us that the tanks seem to have uh, backed off a little bit. They weren't in all of the hospital, just in parts of it. But what we've learned from uh, our chief of hospital today has really come from either hospital officials, the uh, medical uh, hospital managers, if you like, uh, and ultimately they uh, was, uh, were run by uh, Hamas, that group. And then it's on the other hand, uh, we also hear heard from the IDF, the Israeli Defense uh, Force. So we saw uh, pictures of smoke and patients being taken away from what looked like a, a shelling um, inside the intensive care unit. And then we saw video from the Israeli Defense Force suggesting that they have found guns, 13 AK-47s we counted, for example, looking around. It's not the command and control center that we were told yesterday, as far as I can tell so far, um, that we were told yesterday that, we, that would be found. Um, but it, there does appear to be some evidence, according to uh, the Israelis. That doctor that we spoke to, by the way, described how difficult it is in the hospital. Take a listen. We lost 40 patients, more than 40 patients, because of lack of oxygen. We can't operate on patients, we can't give the basic uh, treatment to them, we can't afford the basic personal hygiene needs for these patients. So again, it's totally a disaster situation within the ship hospital. As for those uh, babies that you mentioned, with no reporting yet that anyone has tried to go and help those, although the Israelis do say they have sent in uh, baby food and incubators. Here, as this is unfolding, um, the, the crisis in Al-Shifa Hospital is happening. There is also another dimension that's being added here because we've seen some of the reports. We've seen you and others talk about it. It's, it's the rainy season in Gaza. It is the start of the rainy season here. That, create, that creates some new issues here, some new concerns for the million people displaced by war just now because we're also learning that tens of thousands of people are sick. They don't have access to clean water. Some of these wastewater systems are shutting down. This is, um, this is all sort of happening at once here. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, there, there is uh, no fuel, which means no power, which means, for example, the desalination plant in Gaza isn't working. That means it's very difficult to get just clean water. We did hear news today that fuel came across the Rafa crossing, uh, but it's only, according to reports, for UN vehicles. It, it isn't allowed to be used more widely. So it's a humanitarian crisis with shelling continuing in both the north and the south of the Gaza Strip, honey. Kier Simmons, live for us in Tel Aviv. Kier, thank you for that reporting. Appreciate it. Back here at home now. Tonight, the mystery over who leaked videos with unreported information about one of the election interference cases against the former president and others. It is a mystery that is at least partially solved. With the lawyer for one of 19 defendants confessing in court, he sent copies of so-called proffer videos to a media outlet. Listen. Being transparent with the court and to make sure that uh, nobody else gets blamed for what happened uh, and so that I can go to sleep well tonight. Uh, Judge, I, I did release those videos to one outlet. Okay. I released them to one outlet, he says. This is why the mystery is only partially solved, because we know at least two outlets reported on what's in those videos. And if you're like, well, wait a second, what's a proffer video? Why does that matter? These are videos that are typically filmed as part of a plea deal in a legal case. Because the defendant pleading guilty is often required to tell prosecutors the truth about everything they know about the case. That's exactly what these videos appear to show. Now, you're seeing some of them here. NBC News has not independently obtained them, we should note, with four defendants in the case detailing parts of the alleged scheme to overturn the legitimate 2020 election results in Georgia. NBC's Blaine Alexander is following this one for us. And, and Blaine, people who have watched this show this week know that it was a big deal when these so-called proffer videos came out because of some of the revelations here, some of the potentially significant revelations here. Now, you've got this lawyer saying, hey, judge, I want to be able to sleep at night. I did it. I gave them to at least one outlet. Do we know why somebody would want these video to be public, considering, you know, what they show, that multiple defendants are admitting to some charges against them and the former president? 
Hallie, it was definitely a notable moment in court earlier today when he raised his hand and said, listen, I did it virtually, of course. But this is somebody who is an attorney for Misty Hampton. So he basically said that he believed that the two videos that he was kind of referencing didn't harm his client. In fact, he believed that they actually helped her. And so he believed that they should be public knowledge, that the public should see that. So that was basically his argument. It was good for his client, so he wanted them out there. Now, as you can imagine, the judge had a few things to say about that. One, remember, the DA's team was there arguing in the first place that all of this information should be protected. There shouldn't be any way that something like this can leak in the future. They wanted safeguards against this very thing, and something like this kind of underscores their point. The judge also made the point, yeah, that's all well and good, but there's a time and a place for that, and that is in court, not out in the public and not out in media. Here's a little bit of what Judge Scott McAfee had to say. Take a look. I believe uh, that the First Amendment concerns of this case are not ones to just be ignored or flippantly denied, uh, but until we decide what's going to be relevant and admissible, uh, this case should be tried and not in the court of uh, public opinion as much as possible, but before a jury. So as for the request for a protective order, uh, there is going to be one in place, but kind of one with an asterisk. Essentially, he said he's going to put it in order that's a sort of a compromise, basically saying that everything that's discovery can't be under blanket protection. The DA has to basically point out what they believe is sensitive material, Hallie. There's also this other piece of it, this idea that the DA may want to revoke the bail of one of the defendants because, as she says, he's broken a lot of rules keeping him out of jail. Um, where does that go? What message does that send to the other defendants in this case, including the former president? Well, it basically sends the message that she won't hesitate to throw you back in jail if she feels that you have violated the terms of your bond agreement. This defendant is Harrison Floyd. He is certainly one of the lower profile of the 15 remaining co-defendants. Uh, but he's somebody who has kind of been, I guess you could, many would label him a problem child from the beginning. He's the only one of the 19 co-defendants who spent any time in jail. He was held for several days. Uh, but he has been, according to the DA, uh, tweeting, uh, tweeting and mentioning the Secretary of State, other people in his office. Things that the DA's office says basically amount to witness intimidation. He also appeared on a podcast to discuss uh, the guilty plea of Jenna Ellis. So a lot of things speaking out, basically, that are not allowed under his, the terms of his bond. And that's why the DA says either he c shuts it down or he needs to go back to jail, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, thank you very much. Live first there from Georgia. To Ohio now with some new information tonight about that deadly bus crash we told you about 24 hours ago. With the feds now investigating what caused it, six people dead and the NTSB on site trying to gather evidence. To look at the scene uh, and to look at the vehicles and really get what becomes the perishable evidence, the things that go away or may uh, not be there over time. Roadway markings is a, a, an example of that. It comes as we are now learning the names of the three students killed on the bus. Caitlin Owens, who is just 15. John Mosley, who was 18, Jeffrey Ruel, who was also 18. The other three victims, a teacher and two chaperones, were in a car that was also part of this crash. Shannon Wigfield, Dave Kennett, Christy Gaynor, all six were pronounced dead on scene. 18 other people were hurt and taken to a nearby hospital. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. Jesse, bring us up to speed on this investigation and what else we're learning now about these victims. Yeah, so Hallie, uh, of course, you just mentioned the names of the people who lost their lives here. We know that three of the victims were on the coach bus, which included those school students. And we know that the other three people, according to authorities, were in one passenger vehicle together. They were the three people in a single vehicle, and all three uh, were killed in this collision, according to officials. Something that came out a short time ago from uh, the, the press conference that we had from federal authorities here is that we're told, according to the NTSB, that the coach bus where the school group, which the school group was traveling on, did not have seatbelts except for uh, the driver of that bus. But of course, I've been on a coach bus, and for anyone who's been on a coach bus before, that's not necessarily something that is always on uh, that type of vehicle, but just something that uh, stuck out to us listening in. The NTSB chair also spoke emotionally uh, about the loss here as a mother of a teenager uh, in the same age range as the people who lost their lives as well. Here's part of what she shared earlier. You can't not think about uh, the children that were involved, their families, the um, concern parents at home may have had. I mean, there was, there were, this was really tragic. This was a very serious crash. We're expecting it'll be days before we have a preliminary report.
report from federal investigators on this, and then it could be more than a year before we have that full investigation wrapped up, Hallie. Jesse Kirsch, thank you so much for staying on top of this story and for that update. Tonight, millions of people are under a flood watch along the east coast of Florida. You've got some schools canceling events after school. Miami, West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, seeing a ton of rain. It's a pretty heavy wind, it's like 40 miles an hour. Maybe three inches an hour dropping at times. Tonight, stretching into tomorrow. Listen to the Fort Lauderdale mayor. These are things we have to be very careful about. We've got, to, we've got to harden our infrastructure. We've got to make sure that people are safe and that they can get around their daily lives without the interference of these kinds of weather patterns. Some spots could see 10 plus inches of rain. And look at this. If you know um, your highway geography at all, this is like right down that stretch, at least close to it, of I-95 here. Kathy Park is joining us now from Fort Lauderdale. So here's part of the, the risk and the concern here. Ton of rain. And something called the high king tide, which is like the highest predicted high tide of the year, happening at the same time. There's a real risk here. Hallie, that's absolutely right. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. And we haven't uh, seen that collision just yet. But obviously, it would exacerbate the problem because the floodwaters essentially would have nowhere to go. So that water will continue to rise, potentially lead to a lot of damage um, but we've been planted here in the heart of fort lauderdale los olas boulevard if you've been here you know there are a lot of restaurants and shops but because of this weather there has been very little foot traffic um, but seven months ago if you rewind april 12th there was a historic rain and we were told that los olas boulevard essentially turned into a river we spoke with a store manager earlier today and she said every time a car passed you would see waves actually crash into the front of her building. Fortunately, there wasn't any significant damage, and, and we're kind of hoping that doesn't happen again. We don't get a repeat of that later today. But uh, keep in mind, Hallie, this is a storm that will stretch into tomorrow morning. There's a climate connection here, too, right? Fort Lauderdale, the, the annual rainfall total, like the, the amount of rain that falls in a year is more than 100 inches now. The average is something like 60-ish, right? I mean, this is something that's having a real impact in the day-to-day -day lives of people where you are. Absolutely. And here in Florida and for Floridians, this is the new normal. And, um, you know, I mentioned there has been a lot of a uh, lot less a lot less foot traffic here. Um, we spoke with a, a restaurant just right in front of us and we're told they only had eight customers. So it certainly has an impact on the economy, but it also jogs up memories on what could happen when extreme weather strikes. Take a listen. I feel kind of PTSD here watching this because I did hear that it's going to be a bad storm again. All we can do is the same as everyone else, yeah. sandbags. Yeah. We do have sandbags for the front and the back doors. Um, we just got in our hurricane windows over the during COVID, so we're, we should be protected as much as we can. And Hallie, we spoke with the mayor of Fort Lauderdale, and he said that the city is also fortifying its storm drainage system. So just kind of strengthening that infrastructure um, to basically tackle whatever comes next. Hallie, Kathy Park live for us there in Fort Lauderdale. Kathy, you'll keep us posted, I know, on conditions overnight. Thank you. After a buying spree over the summer, some new stats out today show that a lot of us are cutting back on how much we spend on shopping. This happened for the first time in seven months in October. The drop, just a tenth of 1%, could still be an early sign that the economy is slowing down right as the holiday shopping season is kicking into full swing. You've got folks spending less, look at this, on furniture, at the old home improvement store, on sporting goods, on cars. Partly it's because of high interest rates, partly it's because people have a lot of credit card debt right now. Caleb Silver is joining us now. Caveat, as always, we love our grains of salt on this show. One month does not a trend make, but it is still a significant number here. Talk us through what it means for the things that we care about. Will prices go down, do you think, if this trend continues? Prices might go down, but we're kind of in this steady state of 3 to 3.5% three inflation. We learned that earlier yep. this week. And we've been spending ourselves silly, as you mentioned, pretty much all year. Uh, sales have gone up about 2% this year. Despite inflation, what have we been doing? Putting it on our credit cards, getting that record credit card debt, the average debt per borrower 
hour, around $6,500, just as we're going into the holiday shopping season. But it is one month, and it is only 0.1%. The spending has been strong up until now. So what clues are retailers getting from this, meaning like the big stores that are getting ready for the holiday shopping season? Are they going to change their game, their strategy here, or not really? Yeah, well, you showed the list of things we're not buying or That's buying right. less of. Those are discretionary items. Those are the wants, not the needs. And you heard that from Target already. People are cutting back, but they're also cutting back on the staples right now. Home Depot declining same store sales week after week. So that's very interesting going into this, but it is the holiday shopping season. We shop with the vengeance, especially around this time of year. Holiday uh, shopping is supposed to rise between 3 and 4%, about 900 bucks per person. It's probably going to happen again this year. And I would just say, looking at that list, like I don't see electronics on there. I don't see toys on there. Some of the things that are traditionally these big gift items come the holiday season. Right. And maybe we pulled a lot of that shopping forward. Amazon had a couple of Prime Days earlier. Right. The holiday Black Friday's sales. next week already. That's yeah. Next week, but yeah. they start these sales a lot earlier, and they know we're a little bit exhausted on the spending, so retailers have already kind of been playing into that, but I do expect shoppers to shop like it is holiday season. But then explain something to me. Why is it that then you have Target coming out recently saying that sales are down, but profits are up? So they're selling less stuff, but they're making more money? How does that compute? Yeah, well, they're taking more stuff off the shelf. They had too much inventory, ah. so for what they're selling, they're making a better profit. But Target's had that issue now. They're trying to sort it out. We'll see what the rest of the retailers do this season. Thanks for the breakdown, Caleb Silver. What you're telling me is I should still spend some money this holiday shopping season. Do your that's, job. That's my takeaway. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Coming up, a lot more to get to here on the show, including we're going to show you some pretty scary moments of a boat carrying tourists sinking in the Bahamas. We'll tell you more about this deadly capsize coming up in just a sec. Plus, a home invasion caught on camera, how the victims are doing. Look at this. We'll show you the rest of the video Oof, later in the local. That's coming up. So we're learning tonight that a key moderate Democratic senator is flirting with the presidential run. And why is that so interesting? Well, that could create potentially some problems for President Biden ahead of 2024. We're talking about this guy, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. We told you last week how he's given up his seat in the Senate. He says he's not going to run for re-election. Well, today he is now telling our Kristen Welker he would absolutely consider maybe running for the White House. Listen. Are you considering running for president? I will do anything I can to help my country. Is that a yes? And you're saying, does that mean you would consider it? Absolutely. Every American should consider. If they're in a position to help save the country, I think we're on the wrong course. So I will do everything possible. NBC's Julie Serkin has followed this one for us from Capitol Hill. I mean, like, I'm not trying to run for president, but Senator Manchin obviously leaving that option on the table. And in the interest and the ethos of this show, Julie, which is like, we're just trying to be real with people, I have to tell people, I think Senator Manchin is like next to you doing a live shot for, for a cable network. If he walks behind you, that's why. I just want to let people know that. Um, it is so interesting here because Senator Manchin, as you well know, and I think as our viewers know, has been this power player in the Senate with such a tight margin, right, with such a tight margin for Democrats. His vote has been so critical for the past couple of years. He is stepping away from the Senate. But now thinking about maybe the White House here, right? Um, we don't know how seriously he's considering it, but this speculation matters for the next year, right? Explain that. Yeah, and he's had us speculating on his future moves for quite some time now. He's been throwing out switching parties. He's been saying maybe he'll run for re-election, maybe he won't, maybe he'll run for governor again, maybe he'll run for president again. I mean, in this interview with our Kristen Welker, he did say that he's planning on maybe making a serious decision uh, until uh, up until Super Tuesday. He's giving himself this runway of time to decide. He said he's going to go on a listening tour. I mean, it's very clear that Senator Manchin, along with some of the other uh, Republican and Democrat moderates, that have left Congress, left the Senate in recent months, in recent weeks. I mean, they see this as an institution that can't really make those center deals anymore. They were part of so many bipartisan deal making, and now they're sort of leaving this institution. In Senator Manchin's case, he said he's going on a listening tour around the country to try and see if perhaps the presidential race is somewhere he can make the biggest impact. There's talk uh, that he could potentially run on a third party ticket. We're talking about no labels, that organization that we often talk about that's trying to scout. A third party ticket, Republican, Democrat, a split mixed ticket and saying this is what the party and the country actually needs right now. It it's, remains up to Senator Manchin to see, of course, if he will actually make that decision. But certainly he'll keep us guessing all the way up until Super Tuesday and maybe even after. It's for sure. Julie, is it hilarious or weird for the senator to be standing next to you hearing him talking about you? 
It's kind of funny. I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm like, maybe he likes what I'm saying, maybe not. But it's, a, it's certainly a dynamic we're used to on Capitol Hill. Appreciate you, Julie Sorkin. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police say a woman from Colorado has died in the Bahamas after a tourist boat sank. You can see this ferry, it tips over. There were passengers struggling in the water. Officials are now looking into what caused this. Number two, the suspect arrested for the death of a pro ice hockey player, Adam Johnson, has been released on bail. Remember, Johnson died after his neck was cut by a skate during a game. Police did not give the name or age of the suspect. They say the investigation is continuing. Number three, the FBI is now looking for bodies in connection with the ongoing investigation into the Gambino crime family, according to law enforcement officials familiar with the matter. So what are you looking at? These are aerials now of the search. Remember, last week, 10 men linked to the family were charged in a federal indictment for using violence, extortion, and other crimes. Law enforcement officials say these searches are related to those arrests. We should note that lawyers for some of the men say they did nothing wrong. Number four, the first lady of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy, says today she's running for Senate. She's going up against, well, she's actually, I should say it this way, she's going for the seat that is currently held by Senator Bob Menendez. Remember, he's been indicted on federal bribery charges, but says he does plan on running for re-election. If she wins, Murphy would be the first woman to represent Jersey in the Senate. Number five, three players getting ejected from last night's basketball game between the Warriors and the Timberwolves after a fight happened less than two minutes into the game. ESPN says it's the first game in the past 25 years where multiple players were thrown out before either team even scored. How about that? So listen, in just the last few hours, we are learning that the first Republican official primary will be January 23rd in New Hampshire. Circle that date on your calendar. It's already on mine. Remember, Iowa is a caucus. That comes first technically, but New Hampshire is a primary, so that's why we say it's the first primary. It's coming as there are more and more concerns growing ahead of political ads as we head into the 2024 election. Meta says it'll let people post ads on Facebook and Instagram that claim that the 2020 election was rigged or stolen. Again, we know that's not true. That's not the case. But Meta execs basically say this decision is based on free speech considerations and that they're not going to let people post ads saying this upcoming election next year is not legit. It's not just Meta making some of these controversial changes. In June, YouTube said it would stop removing claims that widespread fraud happened in 2020. Again, no evidence to support that. And X, formerly known as Twitter, announced in August it would again allow political ads on the platform at all after banning them back in 2019. I want to bring in Jake Ward. And Jake, these are some interesting shifts in the rules changes here. Not necessarily new, just getting some renewed attention now. Um, explain the, the thought process, the rationale here from some of these big companies on these moves. Well, Hallie, according to the Wall Street Journal, which has been reporting on this extensively, you know, the internal deliberations here really have everything to do with this free speech concern, this idea that Meta does not want to be in the position of having to judge which elections in the past were legitimate or not, even though you and I in an editorial meeting could probably sort that out pretty quickly. They don't want to be in that position. And so they've made this subtle change that went into effect very quietly last year, but is just coming to light now in which they've gone from saying that you cannot make a political ad that says uh, past elections were rigged or stolen, suddenly you can do that again. You can only currently uh, not talk about an ongoing or upcoming election. And the logic here seems to be that somehow uh, that won't change the perspective of the electorate. Now, worth noting here, right, that as you mentioned, YouTube also loosening up the restrictions on this. Twitter, as we know, under Elon Musk has gone all out on its uh, supposed sort of free speech ideas. The only major platform that does ban political ads at this point is TikTok. They're the last people standing, but Meta joining the fray here, and it seems that more and more candidates are going to take advantage of this. I will just say, part of what is so complicated about this, Jake, is that the um, claims about a stolen election in 2020, again, claims that are not true, are uniquely relevant to the election in 2024. In other words, it is not old history. It is not like a, a dead ball here, right? It is, it is very much a live ball. It is very much at the center now of so much of the conversation around election denialism and uh, who, who's running in 2024. It feels to me like that's where some of the complicating factors come in here. This isn't just something in the past. It's still very relevant to where we're going come November. That's absolutely correct. I mean, for you got to remember, right, that, that like for one huge wing of the Republican Party, that is the brand, right? I mean, one of the reasons that this supposedly that this change supposedly went into effect is that so many Republican politicians wanted to be able to run ads in 2022 about the stolen election that they claimed, you know, the, the false claims of a stolen election in 2020, and they were not allowed to. They wanted to be able to run those ads in order to separate themselves from the rest of the field. So this is not, uh, you know, as we say so often about social media, you know, this is not a glitch. This is a feature 
future. This is exactly what those candidates want to be able to run on and opening that up, allowing that market to go forward for those sorts of claims seems to have been what Meadows decided to do here, Allie. Jake Ward, uh, lots to untangle there. I'm glad to have you on the beat. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, a home invasion caught on camera in Philadelphia. Look at this. You can see these two people running in. They go and attack. Look, a child watching as these people attack two others in the home, apparently hitting one of them in the head with a gun. Police say they are still looking for the four suspects in all, but they do say, fortunately, everybody inside the home is okay. Just so traumatic for so many. Also from our Northeast Bureau, the estranged wife of the Gilgo Beach murder suspect appearing in court with him for the first time today. Rex Huerman was there for a pretrial hearing. Remember, he's pleaded not guilty to the murders of three women. Police say he's also the prime suspect in the killing of a fourth woman. His next court date is set for early next year. Out of our Southeast Bureau, the mother of that six-year-old who shot his teacher in Virginia earlier this year has been sentenced to 21 months in prison. Prosecutors say it was her gun her son used. She was convicted for using cannabis while owning a firearm. When we come back, a lot more to get to, including what the economic impact of war could look like for Israelis and Palestinians for years. A live report from Israel in our original tonight, coming up. As the war between Israel and Hamas plays out on the battlefield in Gaza, the friction between supporters of each side still happening, obviously, here in the United States, especially on college campuses. Students at New York's Columbia University protesting after the school suspended its chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace. The school says the organizations held unauthorized pro-Palestinian events last week that included what they describe, and I'm quoting here, as threatening rhetoric and intimidation. Both groups have called the move selective censorship. Just within the last 24 hours, we've also seen George Washington University back in D.C. saying it also is suspending a group for 90 days over images it projected on the school's library last month. You see them right there. The school is saying in a statement the action violated university policies. An anonymous SJP representative telling GW's student paper it plans to fight the suspension on every front. All of it bringing us to tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the economic toll the Israel-Hamas war is taking on both sides of the border. We saw a big shift in young, available workers, obviously, as Israel rapidly mobilized its military. Because of that, the credit rating agency S&P is now predicting Israel's economy is going to shrink 5% in just the quarter, the last quarter of the year alone. These economic issues already being felt on the ground in both Israel and in Gaza. NBC's Josh Letterman has more. It takes about 100 workers to sow the fields and harvest the crops at Chavivian Organic Farm in southern Israel. On October 7th, the day Hamas attacked, much of the workforce disappeared. First to leave uh, were, of course, the uh, Palestinian workers and the workers from Gaza. They just uh, vanished one day. They're not here. Then foreign workers from Asia and Africa. Some of them stayed, but many went home after Hamas killed dozens of Thai workers on October 7th and took others hostage. These days, when Michal wakes up, she doesn't know how many workers will show up that day. Many farms are now relying largely on volunteers. Are there farms here in Israel that may go out of business because of this war? Uh, many, many, many farms. Here in the fields, just 10 miles from Gaza, as these workers are working the crops, rockets coming from the Gaza Strip being intercepted by the Iron Dome. This is what it's like right now to be working in Israel's economy in the middle of war. Since the war started, Israel has called up more than 350,000 reservists and evacuated hundreds of thousands of others from homes near Gaza and Lebanon. Together, that's 18 percent of the workforce off the job, Israel's Labor Department says. Still, the economic blow pales in comparison to Gaza, where the U.N. says six in ten jobs have been lost during the war and at least 45 percent of homes damaged, adding to an already sky-high poverty rate. In Israel, the military call-up has emptied young, educated workers out of Israel's famed tech sector, says Don Ben-David, an economist at Tel Aviv University. Israel is highly dependent on high tech. Uh, it's only about 10 percent of the workforce, but that 10 percent accounts for half of our exports. Are there comparisons between Israel's wartime economy and what we saw during COVID? Oh, yeah. The fact that missiles are raining down all over the place means that 
you don't really venture out if you don't have to. In other words, people are spending less. Israel's Statistics Bureau says half of businesses have lost at least 50% of their income. At this restaurant in the commuter town of Modi'in, it is far from business as usual. It's a very somber atmosphere, she says. Customers come in head down. No one smiles. People are sad, worried. Naama's cafe closed after the terror attacks for nearly a month and only recently reopened. But it's been a struggle. Staff are in short supply, ingredients are hard to come by, and so are the customers. We went through a tough experience, she says. If this war continues, I don't know how much longer our business will survive. Israel's central bank says this war is costing more than half a billion dollars per week, which in a country this size is a massive amount. But the real question now is, how much longer will this war last? Allie? Our thanks to Josh Letterman for that reporting. We've got a lot more to get to here on the show, including what... <laughs> Wait, let me read this right, because it's a jo- it's like a punchline. Will what happens to F1 in Vegas stay in Vegas? Do you guys get it? That's the tourism slogan for Vegas. But <laughs> we're talking about Formula One. Listen, we're going to have a look at how this weekend's big race could change the sport, maybe. We're going behind the scenes with one of the best reporters on this beat coming up in just a sec. <laughs> Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight it is all about F1 and its most important race of the year coming up in just a couple of days in Vegas. It's important not because of championships on the line. That's already been decided. That was a month ago. It's important because of the millions of dollars being spent between F1's owners, the teams, the sponsors, city officials, making sure the race is a huge success. All of it teeing up this new doc out on CNBC tomorrow night called Inside Track, the business of Formula One that puts some of that into perspective. There's a lot riding on this. Unlike every other race, F1 and Liberty Media are the sole promoters putting on the race here. No middleman. It's requiring a pretty significant investment on your part, north of half a billion dollars, right? Way north of half a billion. And uh, more than more than any other promoter has uh, will have spent by far. What does it cost? Oh, uh, we'll be in it for 600 million at least. That's so much money. Sarah Eisen brings us that documentary. She is in Vegas now for this weekend's race. We are so glad to have you with us, Sarah. Thank you for doing this segment with us. Thank you. So as you know, I Thank think this you. is really it's great to see you. Well, of course, it's really a look behind the curtain of like how this came together here. We've talked about F1 a lot on the show because it feels like it really is on the precipice of maybe becoming huge in the United States. Right. That is what its supporters, its promoters want to see. Were you like an F1 stand before you decided to make this doc? Like how much did you know about it beforehand? <laughs> I have to say, Hallie, the, the way I got into it is my two children, age ah. five and four, were F1 fanatics, are F1 fanatics. They know every driver. They know all the teams. They know all the statistics. They even know the geeky technical stuff like tire strategy. So that's how I got involved because F1 weekends in our house are quite an event. It's the practice. It's the qualifying. It's the race. And there are more than 20 races per year. But it's also an incredible business story, and that's really why I took this on for CNBC. You just heard from Greg Maffei, the CEO of Liberty Media. They bought F1 about six years ago. It was a sleepy motorsport that was popular in Europe, popular in South America, but not even on the map in the United States. Liberty, a U.S. entertainment company, completely flipped the script. They rethought the marketing. They rethought social media. F1 drivers weren't allowed to go on social under the previous owner. Now Lewis Hamilton, the biggest star, has three times the followers as Tom Brady. They also signed with Netflix, Drive to Survive, the docuseries, which opened it up to the U.S. market. So we really took a look at that transformation and how all these companies are now getting into the sport. There's this incredible moment where you take what, what in the F1 world, they call a hot lap around the track with the principal of Team Mercedes, Toto Wolf, somebody who people might know if they've watched the Netflix show. I want to look at just a quick moment from that. I'm getting in the car with Toto Wolf. Are you ready? The CEO, co-owner, and team principal of the Mercedes AMG Petronas F1 team. You have to make sure my seatbelt is right. I've never, I don't think, gone more than 90 miles per hour. Today, we'll go more than twice that fast on what's called a hot lap. Let's do a proper burn out. It's 
one loop around a Formula One track during a race weekend. Wait, I'm obsessed with you're like, I've only ever gone 90, I mean 80, because I know that you're not breaking any speed limit laws, right? But like, I don't know. That, yeah. that feels so bananas to be able to do something like that, right? I mean, did that give you more of an appreciation it, it, for this? Like, tell me about it. It, it did. It gave me more of appreciation for just how risky it is and what it feels like. That moment where I closed my eyes, what you couldn't see, the GoPros didn't capture it, as my feet went up on the dashboard to ground myself. I was terrified. Uh, we were going 180. Your stomach drops. The way you take the turns is also crazy. It's like you're flying in the air. And it's a wild experience, but I have to say it gave me a rush all day long, and I see why the super fans want to do it. And, Hallie, it's such a good illustration of how... Liberty and F1 are thinking about hospitality in a different way. It's not just about the race. It's about the experiences that they give, that these Uber VIPs can take a, can take a ride around for almost 200 miles per hour on the track. They do things like this because they're trying to just open up the sport and cater to a new generation of fans. But I also wonder on the business piece of it, there's a moment where you talk about um, where you're shown some, some million dollar seats here. And, and there has been, I mean, there's some, I think, a bit of a perception around this, that this is like a sport for the top 1% of the top 1%, right? Like, how much are you having those kinds of conversations from the business angle as you're talking to people who promote F1, that this is, you know, this is only for people who can afford it? Absolutely. It was a big theme that, that runs through the documentary. So what you're talking about, the million-dollar package, that's what Wynn Resorts here in Las Vegas is offering. MGM Grand is offering a $5 million package. For Wynn, it's, it's for six people and includes access to the Wynn Suite at the Paddock Building, which is the building right on top of the starting grid and all sorts of experiences, including a hot lap. But yes, there is this, there's this perception that it's, a, it's an elitist sport, and, and that is something that Liberty Media is very aware of, and they're trying to sort of open it up more to fans on social media, in broadcast, to expand the tent. Because on one hand, it's good for the business. It keeps it exclusive and in demand for corporations and high rollers. But on the other hand, you know, you can't alienate all your fans if you want to grow mass market. Sarah Eisen, we're looking forward to watching it tomorrow night and to watching the race. And I'm sure you <laughs> are, you. too, at the great seat in Vegas. Thank you, Sarah, for being with us. You can catch the whole doc Thanks. inside track tomorrow, 8 o'clock Eastern, over on our sister station, CNBC. That does it for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. On the air tonight with two of the most powerful people in the world coming face to face for the first time in a year. President Biden and Chinese Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, trying to talk things out at a time when tensions are high between both these countries. What happened in their meeting behind closed doors? We are live from San Francisco near where it all went down ahead of the president's news conference coming up in just the next hour or so. Plus, a big escalation in the Israeli ground attack in Gaza, with troops launching a raid inside Gaza's main hospital. Why Israeli officials say they need to do this as NBC gets rare access into the Israeli operation. Plus, some intense rain happening in Florida tonight. Millions of people now under a flood watch will tell you just how bad it could get. Then, folks seem to be buying less last month for the first time in a while. Whether that could mean lower prices, perhaps, for the holiday shopping season. And a controversial decision from Meta that could affect the political ads you see come 2024. Why the company says it'll let people post ads that say the 2020 election was rigged, which we know is not true. More on that later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And in just about an hour from now, President Biden is going to hold this news conference here. He's going to talk to the country after this huge, hugely critical meeting with China's Xi Jinping. Here you have two of the most powerful people in the world meeting for their first face-to-face -face conversation in about a year. The president, in just the last hour, saying they made some real progress today. Here's the reality check, right? We were not expecting any massive breakthroughs by any means. The administration has been careful to keep expectations on the lower side. But what they really wanted to come out of this is essentially getting the U.S. and China back on friendly terms, back on speaking terms, trying to get past some of these more tense moments between the two countries. Listen. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. For two large countries like China and the United States, turning their back on each other is not an option. It is unrealistic for one side to remodel the other, and conflict and confrontation has unbearable consequences for both sides.
Monica Alba is joining us now. She is live from San Francisco where this is all happening. So, Monica, as mentioned, we are looking ahead now to this news conference that the president is going to hold. We're going to show it to you live right here on NBC News now after all of these meetings. A real opportunity to get some questions to him about what went down, what his takeaway is. What's the biggest question you have for him? What's the number one thing you're hoping to hear? We really just want to understand, Hallie, when the president says that real progress was made, what does that actually mean? Because for many experts le leading into this, it was more about a resumption to a pretty basic baseline of military to military communication, which is something that we know totally shut down more than a year or so ago, and that really has been at a low point in terms of the relationship between the two countries when we look at the decades-long history between the two. So if they really have agreed to basically get back on track with something that existed in an okay fashion before, that's one thing that we're looking to check off that list. But then in addition to that, were there really these other areas of cooperation where there's going to be any actual progress? That's another huge question mark. And it was really notable that President Biden went into this trying to kind of point to his familiarity with President Xi, the fact that they've met all these times, they have their own kind of history, and that he said, though, at the same time, there would be a kind of candid conversation about the areas where they really do disagree. And that could be anything from how the war in Israel and with Hamas is handled, how the Russia's invasion of Ukraine should proceed given China's differing position and given President Xi's recent meetings with President Putin. So there's plenty of areas here where we may not really see much, but from a diplomatic perspective, I think the White House is going to come out of this and say the fact that this meeting took place, that we had a substantive conversation, for them is going to be their own victory and measure by which to look at the success of this meeting today, Hallie. But what's so critical here context-wise, Montu, is the backdrop that this was happening of, right? Because this is coming on the heels of, obviously, these two wars in the Middle East, these two international crises, coming on the heels of the Chinese spy balloon drama, which feels like a century ago, but really wasn't that long ago. Um, a lot of tension here. So as, 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 as you know, the president looks to move forward. Um, the administration is looking to what's next. Talk through what practically might have to happen to actually establish some of these ideas that the administration has talked about. Because some of this stuff really just comes out in a paper statement. The president's going to come out in this news conference. He's going to say what he's going to say. But exactly, the question is, where are the action items? And we know there are a couple of areas where there could be a joint working group on something like fentanyl, for instance. So if that happens, that could be significant because that's essentially the U.S. asking China to help stem the flow of those chemicals that come from companies in China that then get moved to Mexico, where then they are laced with other drugs and that fentanyl makes its way and is smuggled across the border very oftentimes into the United States. So that is something that the U.S. is very keen on wanting to see some movement on. So that's one potential area. And then the other is there could be new guardrails announced on artificial intelligence as it relates to nuclear weapons. That's something both sides may want to see. But there's a way longer question mark here, Hallie, about whether there's actually any progress on some of the other strategic competition areas here. And we know that President Xi, for his part, is really looking to bolster U.S. investment in China as that has been sliding in recent years. And he, in terms of his response to all of this, he's not going to have a news conference. He doesn't hold news conferences. He doesn't well, answer questions from the press. The way that we're going to hear from him in terms of this meeting is through a big ticket CEO dinner tonight here in San Francisco which it will be very notable on a number of fronts, Hallie. You are hitting something that I think is important here, Mon, because I was looking ahead to the um, to this news conference here, as I think we expect to see perhaps these two leaders walking together momentarily now, which is, yeah, she doesn't answer questions, right? That is not something we're going to hear. His almost, not that it's a news conference, but this big dinner, this big business dinner is an opportunity to hear from him as we are now getting ready to hear from President Biden. Talk about some of the stagecraft that goes into a moment like this, because the president obviously holds news conferences, especially in moments like this. Um, there's a lot riding on this one, an opportunity now for Americans to, to hear from him directly about this. 
Exactly. And that's the way that the U.S. is choosing for Americans to hear how this meeting went. We know that the extended bilateral meeting, a.k.a. when the president and his top cabinet officials sat opposite of President Xi and those counterparts, that lasted around two hours. Remember, you have to factor in time for translators. Then they had a working lunch, which we understand has been going on for about an hour or so. And then there's supposed to be another smaller meeting before President Biden has that solo press conference where he is going to address from his perspective how it went, what some of the potential outcomes could be here, and then what we might see in the future. President Xi is instead going to be departing where they're meeting, and he's going to head to this dinner that's like $2,000 a plate yeah. with some of the top CEOs. You can imagine we're in the heart of Silicon Valley here, so there is a range of companies that will be represented. And we do understand President Biden won't be at that dinner. He has his own separate event, but some top administration officials will attend to represent the United States on that front, since the business community is such an important part of this conversation here. Hallie. Monica Alba, live for us there in San Francisco. We'll look for more of your reporting tonight here on NBC News. Now, lots to come, lots of developments throughout the evening. You'll watch it live right here. Thanks, Mon. Also, a lot of action happening overseas, because we are now learning tonight more about the Israeli military inside Gaza's main hospital and what they're calling a targeted operation against Hamas, a major escalation in this ground attack in the Gaza Strip. The Israelis, defiant, reiterating they're not going to give up on this intense ground campaign in Gaza in retaliation for that horrific Hamas terror attack last month. The Israeli prime minister saying there's no place inside Gaza that the IDF, the Israeli military, will not reach. It comes as we are just seeing this letter posted to X, formerly known as Twitter, by the prime minister's office, where Benjamin Netanyahu's wife writes to the first lady, Jill Biden, that one of the hostages gave birth, one of the Israeli hostages gave birth to her baby while in Hamas captivity. It's important to note here that NBC News has not independently verified this. Again, this is coming solely from the Israeli prime minister's office. It comes as we're seeing this new raid inside Al-Shifa Hospital becoming a centerpiece of this war, adding to the fear, the concern over what could happen to the thousands of civilians, including dozens of premature babies trapped inside with food and water and fuel all running out. We've got to be clear here, too. We just don't know a lot about the reality on the ground, the reality inside the hospital right now. There's also the possibility of a full comms blackout. The biggest telecom company inside Gaza said that could come soon, making it even harder to know what's happening or making it harder for people to just communicate, to talk to one another. Israel says this raid is an operational necessity because the IDF, they say, has intelligence that Hamas is working inside the hospital, storing weapons there, holding hostages there. Hamas denies it, as do Palestinian doctors and health officials. All of it, as the Israelis now say they're letting some fuel into Gaza for the first time since the war started after more and more pressure from aid groups and some international leaders. NBC's Raf Sanchez is getting some rare access tonight, embedding with the Israeli military into Gaza City. You're seeing some of this here, as he is seeing Palestinians, civilians, trying to get down to southern Gaza for the very first time. Watch. For Israel, this is proof of their commitment to get civilians out of harm's way, get them to the relative safety of the south. But for Palestinians, this opens up a lot of their own national trauma of people displaced by war, unsure when, if, they'll ever be able to go home. The Israeli military did put conditions on that embed that Raf Sanchez did. NBC News agreed to show the Israeli military the raw footage collected. Kier Simmons is also live for us in the region. He is on the ground now in Tel Aviv. Kier, let me start with this new piece of information that we're getting in just the last couple of minutes here. This letter from Sarah Netanyahu, again, the Israeli prime minister's wife, about a uh, apparently an Israeli hostage who now has given birth in Hamas captivity, she says. We don't know much beyond that, correct? Well, we don't, Hallie, although we have had some idea about this woman for some time. When you report on a story like this, honestly, with, with so much heartbreak, there are aspects that you leave alone if the family feel like they want you to leave them alone, and, and that's something that's communicated, and, and that's kind of been the case here. This woman, uh, as far as we know, was nine months pregnant when she was kidnapped, um, and so I think the feeling is that she will have given birth. Uh, I'm not sure how clear the facts are, but it is interesting now to hear 
Benjamin Netanyahu's wife, Sarah Netanyahu, writing this letter to the First Lady, uh, talking about this particular aspect of the case, reaching out to the First Lady as, as a mother too, if, if you like, and, and saying, for example, in, in this letter, uh, imagine what's going through that young mother's mind. Uh, I, I think we can all imagine that. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, just adds to the hopes and kind of prayers for uh, the hostages to uh, come home at some point. Uh, again, the, as you say, the, the details are sparse, and I think that's for a reason. Um, but clearly, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister's wife thought it was a particularly salient aspect of what's happened, and that it was worth pointing out to the First Lady and, and kind of connecting on, on that level about this, this terrible series of events. It's just, just horrific, um, and especially, I think, resonant to so many people when it comes to babies, just the most innocent lives of the innocent civilians here. You look at the, yeah. you look at the premature babies, for example, at Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza. That has been a story that we've been following as well. Talk about this hospital, what we know about what's happening there, what could come in the next 24 hours. Well, we got through to a doctor there, finally, after many hours, uh, spoke to him, uh, talked about how frightened he was when, this, uh, when the Israeli forces stormed the hospital. We did ask him about those 36 babies uh, and whether or not anyone had reached them. Uh, the Israelis do say that they have sent in incubators and baby food, uh, but he said that, that there's no sign that they've been reached. There are reports, we were told, of uh, men uh, from 16 to 40 being brought out uh, and then some being arrested, being uh, taken away. We're not clear whether the Israeli Defense Forces are still there. They do say that they have found weapons uh, and they have released video showing that. We can't uh, authenticate that at NBC News, of course. One of the challenges is the video and the information is all coming uh, from uh, outside, not from our own reporters, our own journalists. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so that, that's a crucial question, though, because, uh, of course, uh, the Israelis have said again and again that they think that Al-Shifa Hospital is being used as a Hamas headquarters, and now they are saying that they have found uh, military equipment. Keir Simmons, live for us tonight from Tel Aviv with so many developments, and I know more to come. Keir, thank you for being with us. Appreciate it. Bring you back here to the U.S. now, because tonight the mystery over who leaked videos with unreported information about one of the election interference cases against the former president and others this mystery is at least partially solved. That's because of a moment today in court. We're about to show it to you with this lawyer, one of the 19 defendants, this attorney for one of them, basically confessing in court that he sent copies of these so-called proffer videos to a media outlet. Listen. Being transparent with the court and to make sure that uh, nobody else gets blamed for what happened uh, and so that I can go to sleep well tonight, uh, Judge, I, I did release those videos to one outlet. So there he is. He's saying, hey, so I can sleep. I want to tell you, I did release the videos to one outlet. Now, we say it's only partially solved because we know at least two outlets reported on these videos. And if you're like, well, wait a second, what are these videos? Why do they matter? They're typically filmed, these so-called proffer videos, as part of a plea deal in a legal case where the person pleading guilty is required to share honestly, everything they know about the case. And that's exactly what these videos appear to show. NBC News has not independently obtained them. But four defendants in the case, according to reports, are detailing parts of the alleged scheme to overturn the legitimate 2020 election results in Georgia. NBC's Blaine Alexander is following this one for us tonight. Okay, so this lawyer comes out, says, yes, Your Honor, like it was me. I, I, I essentially gave the, the video, I leaked the, the video to an outlet. Does that put him or his client in hot water? Surprisingly, not necessarily, Hallie. In fact, he didn't even get a particularly strong admonishment from the judge after he came forward and said that he did it. Now, what we did here, of course, was this was the hearing, uh, basically an emergency hearing called by the DA and her team, basically saying we need some safeguards to stop something like this from happening again. And so as the judge was going one by one, hearing from uh, the defense attorneys for all 15 uh, of the remaining co-defendants, that's when this attorney for Misty Hampton said what you just heard him say. Now, here's where we are with that protection order. The judge said he is going to issue some sort of an order, but it's going to be a compromise. Basically, not everything that is discovery is going to be subject to this order, but basically the DA's team has to go through and say what they deem to be sensitive information. Here's what the judge had to say about all this. Take a look. I believe uh, that the First Amendment concerns of this case are not ones to just be ignored or flippantly denied, uh, but until we decide what's going to be relevant and admissible, uh, this case should be tried, and not in the court of uh, public opinion as much as possible, 
but before a jury. And Hallie, we do expect him to issue that order sometime tomorrow. Hallie. There's also something interesting that came out today, which is the district attorney here, the DA, said that this case and probably trial could stretch into 2025, meaning it could very well overlap with a presidential election that Donald Trump could very well be involved in, right? I mean, the, the complication factor here feels um, potentially exponential, depending on timing. It's very likely that it will. Just something like today shows you just how complicated and sprawling this case is. So when you think about the fact that, yes, she said the trial is going to take many months, it'll span certainly into the winter of next year and very likely into 2025. Now, when she was asked about that, about that timeline, somebody said, okay, you know, that could mean election season. That could mean election day. And she said, when I bring charges, I don't think about things like this. And she said it like this. She says, think about how sad it would be if somebody, anybody who's facing charges around the country can go out and run for city council or any other office and suddenly have those charges dropped. She said that running for public office shouldn't have any bearing on criminal charges, no matter how high of an office you're talking about, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, live for us there in Atlanta. Blaine, thank you very much. To Ohio now, it's new information tonight about that deadly bus crash about 24 hours ago with the feds now investigating what caused it. Six people are dead. The NTSB now on site to try to gather some evidence. To look at the scene, uh, and to look at the vehicles and really get what becomes the perishable evidence, the things that go away or may uh, not be there over time. Roadway markings is a, a, an example of that. It comes as we're now learning the names of the three students killed on the bus. Caitlin Owens, John Mosley, Jeffrey Rurell. The other three victims, a teacher and two chaperones, were in a car that was also part of the crash. Shannon Wigfield... Dave Kennett, Christy Gaynor. All six pronounced dead on scene. 18 other people were hurt and taken to a hospital nearby. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. Do you know anything else about the, con the condition of those people who are hospitalized or where this investigation goes next? Yeah, Hallie, at this point, few details coming out and, and to your point about where this investigation goes next. Long time still to go on this. It, it could be more than a year uh, before we have uh, the full report on this investigation. So more to come for sure, but something that uh, came out of a press conference earlier with the chair of the NTSB was the fact that the coach bus with this school group did not have seat belts except for the bus driver. But, you know, if you've been on a coach bus before, you might uh, remember they don't always have seat belts. So that doesn't uh, necessarily uh, mean that this is something that was abnormal, but it, it did stick out uh, to us, you know, following along with that press conference. And we heard from the NTSB chair speaking uh, emotionally as a mother of someone, she says, in the same age range as those who lost their lives. Uh, she also spoke about what she calls a public health crisis with traffic fatalities. Uh, according to federal officials, we've got close to 43,000 people who died in motor vehicle accidents last year alone. Just gives you a perspective on, on the seriousness of these kinds of incidents and the frequency of them uh, across the country. Here's part of what the NTSB chair shared earlier. We've issued several safety recommendations over the years. We've literally given entities a road map on how to save lives. But many of those recommendations aren't implemented. If they're not implemented, safety change doesn't occur. And again, we're looking at 12 to 18 months for a full report from authorities, and it's going to be several days before we even get a preliminary, uh, preliminary investigative findings from officials. Hallie. Jesse Kirsch, thank you very much for that update. Take it down south where millions of people are under a flood watch tonight along the east coast of Florida, with some schools having to cancel events after school. You've got Miami, West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, all seeing a bunch of rain and some pretty intense wind, 40 miles an hour. We're talking rain falling at the rate of maybe three inches an hour, stretching into tomorrow. Listen to what the mayor had to say. These are things we have to be very careful about. We've got to, we've got to harden our infrastructure. We've got to make sure that people are safe and that they can get around their daily lives without the interference of these kinds of weather patterns. Some spots could see up to 10 inches of rain. And if you know your highway geography in the southeast, you know that this is right along the I-95 corridor here. Kathy Park is joining us now from Fort Lauderdale. So I'm looking at your live shot here, Kathy. Listen, you're not in the middle of a hurricane. Like, we want to calibrate the freakout impact here. People don't need to, like, have a heart attack at this point. But they do need to be on the watch for the potential for some of these floods, partly because of an intense high tide that's predicted. Talk to us about what you're hearing from officials about the danger here. 
Yeah, so Hallie, you're absolutely right. It really just has been uh, a messy day, just a washout. I'm standing under an awning right now, but behind me, uh, the rain is really coming down. We've been hit with uh, some heavy showers throughout the day today, so that has led to some localized flooding and ponding, but no major problems report just yet. But keep in mind, the storm is supposed to stretch until tomorrow morning, so we could be looking at uh, problems during the overnight hours. The crews, as you can imagine, they are on standby for any uh, possible emergencies that they may have to respond to. We know several pumps have also been deployed throughout the area as well. And we're also seeing many reports of delays at airports, both in Miami as well as Fort Lauderdale. And as you mentioned, um, the King Tide, it's supposed to happen around 916 tonight. So if that coincides with another heavy bout of rain that could also spell some trouble in these areas, Hallie. In Fort Lauderdale, that area has had a ton of rain this year, right? Like way above normal. Talk about that and the climate connection. Yeah, I mean, they have had um, over uh, 100 inches of rain alone. And then when you add the rain that we're going to see um, today and then through it, tomorrow morning, um, we're going to be exceeding the, the annual total. So, yeah, this is definitely uh, a connection that we're seeing to climate change. And we spoke with residents here. This is uh, Las Olas Boulevard. If you've been in this area, this is a heart of Fort Lauderdale, lots of restaurants and businesses, and there hasn't been any foot traffic. So obviously this weather has an impact on the economy. And it also jogs memories of what severe weather can do, especially when you just rewind seven months ago, April 12th, this area actually got a lot of rain, uh, 25 inches of rain in 24 hours. And that was pretty traumatic for some folks. Take a listen. I feel kind of PTSD here watching this because I did hear that it's going to be a bad storm again. All we can do is the same as everyone else, yeah. sandbags. Yeah. We do have sandbags for the front and the back doors. Um, we just got in our hurricane windows over the during COVID, so we're, we should be protected as much as we can. And Hallie, because of all of this extreme weather that we are now experiencing, we spoke with the mayor of Fort Lauderdale earlier today. He told us that they fortifying their storm drainage system so that they are able to tackle these types of storms moving forward. Allie. Kathy Park live for us there in South Florida. Kathy, thank you. After a shopping spree over the summer, some new stats out today show that a lot of us cut back on how much we're spending on shopping. This happened for the first time in seven months in October, a downward trend. Although, let me correct myself. One month does not a trend make. However, this drop only a tenth of one percent could still be an early sign, according to the experts, that economy is slowing down right as the holiday shopping season is kicking into full swing. Folks are spending less on stuff like furniture, home improvement, sporting goods, cars, partly because of high interest rate, partly because a lot of people have a lot of credit card debt right now. The National Retail Federation is still projecting holiday season sales to be up between three and four percent over last year. Got a lot more to get to here on the show, including thousands of people forced to evacuate in Iceland after hundreds more earthquakes happen overnight. How soon a big volcano there could erupt. Plus, what a new study says is linked to a global decline in male fertility. A key moderate Democratic senator is flirting with a presidential run, and that could potentially create a big headache for President Biden ahead of the 2024 election. We're talking about this guy here, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. You already know he's given up his seat in the Senate. That was big news last week. Well, now today he's telling our own Kristen Welker he would absolutely consider running for president. Listen. Are you considering running for president? I will do anything I can to help my country. Is that a yes? And you're saying, does that mean you would consider it? Absolutely. Every American should consider if they're in a position to help save the country. I think we're on the wrong course. So I will do everything possible. NBC's Ryan Nobles is following this one for us live from Capitol Hill. So much speculation around the political future of Joe Manchin, right? Was he going to run for a Senate re-election? That question has been asked and answered. Now this question is, could you run as a third party candidate in 24? That question has been asked and kind of answered because he's like, I'm not shutting the door to it. Explain why that is so significant here and why that is sending in the eyes of some chills up the spines of some uh, pro-Biden Democratic operatives. 
Yeah, well, first off, Hallie, credit to our colleague Kristen for nailing him down on this because so many people have asked him this question after he uh, decided that he wasn't going to run for re-election to the Senate, and she's the first to get him to, to use that word absolutely, that he's actually seriously considering it. Uh, but I do think we need to do somewhat of a reality check uh, as it relates to whether or not Joe Manchin is actually a credible potential candidate for president of the United States. Uh, to run an independent campaign, which is likely what he would have to do, uh, requires an enormous amount of money and an enormous amount of logistics. It means getting on the ballot in all 50 states or even just getting on the ballot in a handful of states uh, if his uh, goal is to play spoiler. And if his goal is to play spoiler, that is what has Democrats so concerned. He is a Democrat, even though uh, he often votes with Republicans. He really considers himself middle of the road. There is that fear that he would siphon votes away from the incumbent president, Joe Biden, especially when you look at some of the president's polling numbers and concerns that many Americans have uh, over his age and other issues of which the president is presiding over. So this is a complicated issue, but the one thing we know for sure is that Joe Manchin wants to remain in the conversation. If he just decides and declares that he's not running for anything in the future, we're going to stop asking him questions. He's going to stop being a relevant force in the political conversation. So I think at the very least, this is just an opportunity for him to stay in the game, at least right up until the last minute, Hallie. Ryan Nobles, interesting stuff. Thank you, sir. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police say a woman from Colorado died in the Bahamas after a tourist boat sank. Look at this. This is the ferry. You can see it's tipped over. Some passengers are in the water trying to swim. Officials are looking into what exactly went so wrong here. Number two, the FBI is looking for bodies in connection with the ongoing investigation into the Gambino crime family, according to law enforcement officials familiar with the matter. Th this is what you're seeing here, aerials of the search. You might remember last week, 10 men were linked to the family. We're charged in a federal indictment for a variety of crimes, including extortion, etc. Law enforcement officials say these searches you're seeing here are related to those arrests. Lawyers for some of the men deny they did anything wrong. Number three, male fertility has been declining in parts of the world for decades, and researchers now think they know why. Pesticides. Researchers have found that men exposed to certain classes of pesticides have a way lower sperm count. They're still looking into how exactly that happens, how the pesticides actually affect sperm concentrations, but it's another clue. Number four, it's possible that the cost to put all this food on your Thanksgiving dinner table next week could be a little bit cheaper. That's because the American Farm Bureau Federation says the cost of a 16-pound turkey is down about 6% from last year. Why? Well, after losing a bunch of turkeys to bird flu, farms raised a lot of extra ones this year just as a precaution. Number five, remember Gwyneth Paltrow's ski trial that went viral this year? A skier filed a lawsuit against Gwyneth Paltrow after the two collided on the slopes. The jury, remember, ultimately ruled in Paltrow's favor. Guess what? It's getting turned into a musical. It's called Gwyneth Goes Skiing. It's set to debut in London next month. We'll see if any moments from that go as viral as moments from that trial. So listen, in just the last few hours, we've found out that the first Republican primary, not caucus, but primary, will be January 23rd in New Hampshire. That coming is there's more and more concern now over political ads ahead of the start of the 2024 election, the official start of the election season. That's because Meta says it's going to let people post ads on Facebook and Instagram that say that the 2020 election was rigged or stolen. We know that that is not true. Meta execs essentially say this decision is based on free speech considerations. And they also say they're not going to let people post ads saying that this upcoming election next year is not legit. Meta is not the only one making controversial changes. Back in June, YouTube said it would stop removing claims that widespread fraud happened in 2020. Again, it did not. And X, formerly known as Twitter, announced in August it would again allow political ads after banning them back in 2019. Let's bring in Jake Ward now for more. These are some interesting shifts in the rules changes here. Not necessarily new, just getting some renewed attention now. Um, explain the, the thought process, the rationale here from some of these big companies on these moves. Well, Hallie, according to the Wall Street Journal, which has been reporting on this extensively, you know, the internal deliberations here really have everything to do with this free speech concern, this idea that Meta does not want to be in the position of having to judge which elections in the past were legitimate or not, even though you and I in an editorial meeting could probably sort that out pretty quickly. They don't want to be in that position. And so they've made this subtle change that went into effect very quietly last year, but is just coming to light now in which they've gone from saying that you cannot make a political 
political ad that says uh, past elections were rigged or stolen, suddenly you can do that again. You can only currently uh, not talk about an ongoing or upcoming election. And the logic here seems to be that somehow uh, that won't change the perspective of the electorate. Now, worth noting here, right, that as you mentioned, YouTube also loosening up the restrictions on this. Twitter, as we know, under Elon Musk has gone all out on its uh, supposed sort of free speech ideas. The only major platform that does ban political ads at this point is TikTok. They're the last people standing, but Meta joining the fray here, and it seems that more and more candidates are going to take advantage of this. I will just say part of what is so complicated about this, Jake, is that the um, claims about a stolen election in 2020, again, claims that are not true, are uniquely relevant to the election in 2024. In other words, it is not old history. It is not like a, a dead ball here, right? It is, it is very much a live ball. It is very much at the center now of so much of the conversation around election denialism and uh, who, who's running in 2024. It feels to me like that's where some of the complicating factors come in here. This isn't just something in the past. It's still very relevant to where we're going come November. That's absolutely correct. I mean, for you got to remember, right, that like for one huge wing of the Republican Party, that is the brand, right? I mean, one of the reasons that this supposedly cha that this change supposedly went into effect is that so many Republican politicians wanted to be able to run ads in 2022 about the stolen election that they claim, you know, the, the false claims of a stolen election in 2020, and they were not allowed to. They wanted to be able to run those ads in order to separate themselves from the rest of the field. So this is not, uh, you know, as we say so often about social media, you know, this is not a glitch. This is a feature. This is exactly what those candidates want to be able to run on and opening that up, allowing that market to go forward for those sorts of claims seems to have been what Meadows decided to do here, Allie. Jake Ward, uh, lots to untangle there. I'm glad to have you on the beat. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams around the world have done it for you. Here are some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Ukraine, at least two people have died in the Donetsk region overnight after Russia fired off missiles. Ukrainian forces do say they've gained some ground elsewhere crossing a key river. That area is seen as one of Russia's most strategic barriers in the war. The Kremlin says Ukraine faces hellfire there and that the average life expectancy of a soldier there is something like two days. Out of Iceland, the threat of a volcanic eruption is very real. There have been hundreds of earthquakes in the last 24 hours, with police in one coastal town hoping that an eruption doesn't happen directly there, but it's hard to pinpoint where it could happen. That area has been evacuated, but some folks can still go in to grab some personal belongings. You can see what it looks like here. Out of Colombia, officials there are starting to sterilize hippos. The animals are apparently descendants of drug kingpin Pablo Escobar's pets. Since then, they have multiplied. There's like a hundred roaming in rivers. They have no natural predators there. They're essentially a big invasive species. When we come back, the economic impact of the war between Israel and Hamas already being felt by both Israelis and Palestinians. We've got a report from Israel coming up in tonight's original. As the war between Israel and Hamas plays out on the battlefield in Gaza, the friction between supporters of each side still happening, obviously, here in the United States, especially on college campuses. Students at New York's Columbia University protesting after the school suspended its chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace. The school says the organizations held unauthorized pro-Palestinian events last week that included what they describe, and I'm quoting here, as threatening rhetoric and intimidation. Both groups have called the move selective censorship. Just within the last 24 hours, we've also seen George Washington University back in D.C. saying it also is suspending a group for 90 days over images it projected on the school's library last month. You see them right there. The school is saying in a statement the action violated university policies. An anonymous SJP representative telling GW's student paper it plans to fight the suspension on every front. All of it bringing us to tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the economic toll the Israel-Hamas war is taking on both sides of the border. We saw a big shift in young, available workers, obviously, as Israel rapidly mobilized its military. Because of that, the credit rating agency S&P is now predicting Israel's economy is going to shrink 5% in just the quarter, the last quarter of the year alone. These economic issues already being felt on the ground in both Israel and in Gaza. NBC's Josh Letterman has more. It takes about 100 workers to sow the fields and harvest the crops at Chavivian Organic Farm in southern Israel. 
On October 7th, the day Hamas attacked, much of the workforce disappeared. First to leave uh, were, of course, the uh, Palestinian workers and the workers from Gaza. They just uh, vanished one day. They're not here. Then foreign workers from Asia and Africa. Some of them stayed, but many went home after Hamas killed dozens of Thai workers on October 7th and took others hostage. These days, when Michal wakes up, she doesn't know how many workers will show up that day. Many farms are now relying largely on volunteers. Are there farms here in Israel that may go out of business because of this war? Uh, m many, many, many farms. Here in the fields, just 10 miles from Gaza, as these workers are working the crops, rockets coming from the Gaza Strip being intercepted by the Iron Dome. This is what it's like right now to be working in Israel's economy in the middle of war. Since the war started, Israel has called up more than 350,000 reservists and evacuated hundreds of thousands of others from homes near Gaza and Lebanon. Together, that's 18 percent of the workforce off the job, Israel's Labor Department says. Still, the economic blow pales in comparison to Gaza, where the U.N. says six in ten jobs have been lost during the war, and at least 45 percent of homes damaged, adding to an already sky-high poverty rate. In Israel, the military call-up has emptied young, educated workers out of Israel's famed tech sector, says Don Ben-David, an economist at Tel Aviv University. Israel is highly dependent on high tech. Uh, it's only about 10 percent of the workforce, but that 10 percent accounts for half of our exports. Are there comparisons between Israel's wartime economy and what we saw during COVID? Oh, yeah. The fact that missiles are raining down all over the place means that you don't really venture out if you don't have to. In other words, people are spending less. Israel's Statistics Bureau says half of businesses have lost at least 50 percent of their income. At this restaurant in the commuter town of Modi'in, it is far from business as usual. <laughs> it's a very somber atmosphere, she says. Customers come in head down. No one smiles. People are sad, worried. Naama's cafe closed after the terror attacks for nearly a month and only recently reopened. But it's been a struggle. Staff are in short supply, ingredients are hard to come by, and so are the customers. We went through a tough experience, she says. If this war continues, I don't know how much longer our business will survive. Israel's central bank says this war is costing more than half a billion dollars per week, which in a country this size is a massive amount. But the real question now is, how much longer will this war last? Allie? Our thanks to Josh Letterman for that reporting. We've got a lot more to get to here on the show, including what... <laughs> Wait, let me read this right, because it's a jo it's like a punchline. Will what happens to F1 in Vegas stay in Vegas? Do you guys get it? That's the tourism slogan for Vegas. But we're talking about Formula One. Listen, we're going to have a look at how this weekend's big race could change the sport, maybe. We're going behind the scenes with one of the best reporters on this beat coming up in just a sec. <laughs> to get the backstory, our behind-the-scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, it is all about F1. And it's most important race of the year coming up in just a couple of days in Vegas. It's important not because of championships on the line. That's already been decided. That was a month ago. It's important because of the millions of dollars being spent between F1's owners, the teams, the sponsors, city officials, making sure the race is a huge success. All of it teeing up this new doc out on CNBC tomorrow night called Inside Track, the business of Formula One that puts some of that into perspective. There's a lot riding on this. Unlike every other race, F1 and Liberty Media are the sole promoters putting on the race here. No middleman. It's requiring a pretty significant investment on your part, north of half a billion dollars, right? Way north of half a billion. And more than more than any other promoter has will have spent by far. What does it cost? Oh, uh, we'll be in it for 600 million at least. That's so much money. Sarah Eisen brings us that documentary. She is in Vegas now for this weekend's race. We are so glad to have you with us, Sarah. Thank you for doing this segment with us. Thank you. So as you know, I Thank think you. this is really Holly, it's great to see you. Well, of course, it's really a look behind the curtain of like how this came together here. We've talked about F1 a lot on the show because it feels like it really is on the precipice of maybe becoming huge in the United States. Right. That is what its supporters, its promoters want to see. Were you like an F1 stand before you decided to make this doc? Like how much did you know about it beforehand? <laughs> 
I have to say, Holly, the, the way I got into it is my two children, age ah. five and four, were F1 fanatics, are F1 fanatics. They know every driver. They know all the teams. They know all the statistics. They even know the geeky technical stuff like tire strategy. So that's how I got involved because F1 weekends in our house are quite an event. It's the practice, it's the qualifying, it's the race, and there are more than 20 races per year. But it's also an incredible business story, and that's really why I took this on for CNBC. You just heard from Greg Maffei, the CEO of Liberty Media. They bought F1 about six years ago. It was a sleepy motorsport that was popular in Europe, popular in South America, but not even on the map in the United States. Liberty, a U.S. entertainment company, completely flipped the script. They rethought the marketing. They rethought social media. F1 drivers weren't allowed to go on social under the previous owner. Now Lewis Hamilton, the biggest star, has three times the followers as Tom Brady. They also signed with Netflix, Drive to Survive, the docuseries, which opened it up to the U.S. market. So we really took a look at that transformation and how all these companies are now getting into the sport. There's this incredible moment where you take what, what in the F1 world they call a hot lap around the track with the principal of Team Mercedes, Toto Wolf, somebody who people might know if they've watched the Netflix show. I want to look at just a quick moment from that. I'm getting in the car with Toto Wolf. Are you ready? The CEO, co-owner, and team principal of the Mercedes AMG Petronas F1 team. You have to make sure my seatbelt is right. I've never, I don't think, gone more than 90 miles per hour or 80. Today, we'll go more than twice that fast on what's called a hot lap. Let's do a proper burn off. One loop around a Formula One track during a race weekend. Wait, I'm obsessed with you're like, I've only ever gone 90. I mean 80, because I know that you're not breaking any speed limit laws, right? But like, I don't know. That, yeah. that feels so bananas to be able to do something like that, right? I mean, did that give you more of an appreciation it, it, for this? Like, tell me about it. It, it did. It gave me more of appreciation for just how risky it is and what it feels like. That moment where I closed my eyes, but you couldn't see, the GoPros didn't capture it, as my feet went up on the dashboard to ground myself. I was terrified. Uh, we were going 180. Your stomach drops. The way you take the turns is also crazy. It's like you're flying in the air. And it's a wild experience, but I have to say it gave me a rush all day long, and I see why the super fans want to do it. And, Hallie, it's such a good illustration of how... Liberty and F1 are thinking about hospitality in a different way. It's not just about the race. It's about the experiences that they give, that these Uber VIPs can take a, can take a ride around for almost 200 miles per hour on the track. They do things like this because they're trying to just open up the sport and cater to a new generation of fans. But I also wonder on the business piece of it, there's a moment where you talk about um, where you're shown some, some million dollar seats here. And, and there has been, I mean, there's some, I think, a bit of a perception around this, that this is like a sport for the top 1% of the top 1%, right? Like, how much are you having those kinds of conversations from the business angle as you're talking to people who promote F1, that this is, you know, this is only for people who can afford it? Absolutely. It was a big theme that, that runs through the documentary. So what you're talking about, the million dollar package, that's what Wynn Resorts here in Las Vegas is offering. MGM Grand is offering a $5 million package. For Wynn, it's, it's for six people and includes access to the Wynn Suite at the Paddock Building, which is the building right on top of the starting grid and all sorts of experiences, including a hot lap. But yes, there is this, there's this perception that it's, a, it's an elitist sport. And, and that is something that Liberty Media is very aware of. And they're trying to sort of open it up more to fans on social media and broadcast to expand the tent. Because on one hand, it's good for the business. It keeps it exclusive and in demand for corporations and high rollers. But on the other hand, you know, you can't alienate all your fans if you want to grow mass market. Sarah Eisen, we're looking forward to watching it tomorrow night and to watching the race. And I'm sure you Thank are, you. too, at the great seat in Vegas. Thank you, Sarah, for being with us. You can catch the whole doc Thanks. inside track tomorrow, 8 o'clock Eastern, over on our sister station, CNBC. That does it for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.